Yo, Todd, how are you? What's up, my brother? It's good to see you. Likewise, man, I'm super excited to uh, to geek out with you today. Um, welcome everyone to Modern Sales Power Hour. We are uh, so pumped to have the illustrious Todd Capone here today. More about him in a hot second. But uh, Todd, as we kind of um, wait for folks to trickle in here, um, where are you at, man? You look like uh, you look like a Sasquatch is going to like jump out from behind you and like you know kneecap you. Where are you in the? Yeah. Where where are you at? And I've been on the road for the last week, so I'm looking like a Sasquatch. So I might be attacking myself here. Oh yeah, but, there you go. They, uh, maybe, maybe that's what I that, that's what was like top of mind for me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm up in Wisconsin, uh, just southeast of Lake Geneva in uh, Powers Lake. So Powers Lake is right outside the window here, so you could. I see the reflection on the glass back there, but uh, hanging out up here this weekend. I love it. That's fantastic. Um, and then any big plans this weekend? You're going to be, uh, you're going to take the Sasquatch uh, um, water skiing or fishing or what's the, we're probably what's the just, deal there? We're, we're more the troll type. So uh, we've got a, a little uh, 18 foot uh, recreational bay liner out there that we'll probably jump on maybe even later this afternoon and just go whipping around. It's a, uh, the lake is, I think it's like square, a uh, three square mile lake. So it's not real big, but it's super quiet. Like right now, I don't see any boats on there at all. So like you just go and can be an idiot all you want. I love it. That's my favorite thing to do on, on lakes is to be an idiot. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Well, we can get, we can get jamming here. I'm really excited to, to chat with you about your new book, um, your, your your former book, or sorry, old book. It's not former. It will always be your first. It will always be your book, um, and you know, sales history and and just all gen, general uh, sales nerdery, modern sales nerdery. Um, so, folks, for for people who haven't joined us before, um, you know, thanks for joining us for Modern Sales Power Hour. I'm Pete Kazanji. Um, you know, and so just this is a really interactive event. What we'd love folks to do is use the Q&A panel, use commenting as much as possible. Um, you can go ahead and let us know where you're um, calling in from today. Uh, so we can, um, so you can let us know which, which lake in the great uh, white north you're in as well. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar, Power Hour is hosted by Modern Sales Pros. Um, MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales and revenue operations, sales development, and the related disciplines. And so the community's mission is pretty straightforward. It's the created environment for our 27,000 and growing members to answer questions they struggle to solve on their own, help them see around corners they may not know about. Uh, and so the way that we do that is through great life sessions, like what you're about to experience uh, through a robust online forum, uh, and, and also in-person events. So for those who weren't previously in the community, we'll go ahead and add you. Uh, and so before we get started, a couple of reminders here. So Power Hour is a unique format. Uh, there's not really a specific piece of content that we're going to be walking through. Instead, what we're doing is we're, you know, uh, picking the brain of the, uh, the illustrious revenue leader that we have um, joining us. Um, normally, today we have Todd. And, um, and uh, so the, the reminder here is that you're here to learn. Uh, this is the idea here is that, you know, use Q&A as much as possible. People submitted a bunch of questions ahead of time as well. So, um, so with that, let's go ahead and um, jump into some introductions here. I can go first really quickly. Uh, so my name is Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders of Atrium. Um, we make what we like to call data-driven sales management software that helps sales managers, so AE, SDR, AM, CSM managers, and sales leaders uh, use metrics and data to improve rep performance. Um, prior to Atrium, I started a software company called Talentbin in 2010 that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014. And that was like really where I started like kind of on my sales, um, you know, sales nerdery journey, if you will. Um, you know, I was a, a business generalist founder at Talentbin. I was our first, then I was our first rep, our first sales manager, and then eventually our sales leader. We were you know, 20 person sales organization when we were acquired by Monster. And then at Monster, I was responsible for new product sales um, across a, a thousand person sales organization. So a little bit different, uh, different, different challenges there. And so that's kind of like the, the big thing that uh, got me going here. I also wrote a book on sales for, um, you know, on a book on startup sales called Founding Sales. So that's a little bit on me. Um, 
you know, Todd's absolutely fantastic. I think if you haven't heard of the transparency sale, I don't know what rock you've been living under for the last however long. Um, but Todd, maybe you can kind of give folks a little bit of a arc of your of your journey, kind of like starting out, maybe like you know, people have probably heard of exact target and Salesforce, they've probably heard of SAP. Maybe you can kind of give people your background, like kind of what brought you to being this uh, you know celebrated sales author. Oh, thank you. Um, my, my journey is that of being what I call a B, B plus sales rep. Um, but <laughs> I always knew that my heart was in coaching, teaching, and kind of all the nerdery around like learning science. And so, yeah, I, uh, you know, I came out of college, I was selling overnight shipping. Uh, I went huh. to, I, I, like I did Airborne Express, uh, which wow. is like no longer, I think they got acquired by DHL years ago, but um, yep. yeah, exactly. I, all right, uh, this will date me, but um, 1994, <laughs> I was living in Southern California. Um, my territory was basically Southern California. I drove 24,000 miles in six months on that job. And like oh the God. job was basically door-to-door -door business selling. And then at night, I would follow uh, FedEx trucks or UPS trucks around to see where they were making their biggest pickups. And then like that uh, would be the place. Yeah, exactly. It's prospecting by being a creep. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, I got an intro to, uh, my, my, got a half brother who was working at computer associates. Like remember uh, them CA and, uh, he got me into an entry level job there. I ended up in the tech space, uh, CA SAP, uh, ran a couple of startups in the ground in the early two thousands, like was the cool as, thing as, to do. as one does. Yes, exactly. Um, and then I went, I, I literally, uh, took everything I had and I sold it. And I bought a sales training company in 2003. Like my, my career just felt like I was stuck and I wanted to break free and like kind of change it and go do some teaching. And I ran that in the ground too. But in the process, two things happened. Number one is I got to uh, get certified on facilitation skills. Like how do you own a room? How do you teach? And like, that was where the kind of the nerdery of learning started. But yeah, then yeah. Um, I also, you know, in the process of barely getting by, I, I worked with probably 40 or 50 companies and they're, they're leaders. And I got to see which ones do it well and which ones don't. Right. And like, for me, that was better than an MBA. And sure. uh, so I came out of that, uh, quickly ended up in like running sales ops for a tech company. I got promoted to VP of sales. And I'll tell that story when we talk about the new book, because that right. literally yeah. triggered it. And then, yeah, um, I went to, I would, you know, bounced around to a couple of roles, uh, went to exact target. We went through the IPO and then sold to Salesforce for a little under 3 billion in 2013. And then went over to power reviews to build that, uh, back, back up from the ground up. And we turned it into uh, Chicago's fastest growing tech company from 2014 to 2017. And then like a lunatic, I went and wrote a book and, uh, left it all. So <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm I, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, like, I can kind of roll into why, like why I decided to write the book, because that probably yeah, will, give everybody a little. Yeah, back on, on yeah I would like, yeah, may, maybe you can give folks like a synopsis of, of like for folks who are not familiar with the transparency yeah. sale, kind of the, the prequel to the transparency sales leader, like, yeah, what inspired you? to, yeah. uh, to ch chuck it all and, and decide to write a book. <laughs> yeah. And so like for everybody listening to like, hopefully this is really relatable. Um, power reviews. You probably guess from the name what we did. We were in the ratings and review space. So we helped mm -hmm. retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. So all of you have interacted with power reviews before and just not known it. Like you go buy a pair of shoes on Crocs. You look at the shoes, yeah. scroll down. There's reviews. That was us in the background helping with the, the collect and display. Here's what happened. We did a research study with Northwestern University that was simply looking at, all right, when a website's acting as a salesperson, what do people do, right? Like, how do they interact? And there was three data points that came out of it, two of which changed my life like it only happened to a nerd. All right. So the, the first data point that didn't was that we all read reviews today. And I'm assuming all of you, when you're buying something you haven't bought before, yeah, that's of yeah. medium to high consideration, you read reviews. It turns out it was 96% back then, now it's 99%. Sure. But here's the two data points that changed my life. And again, this is when a website's acting as a salesperson, 
but yeah. I'm going to tell you how that relates to when you as a human are acting as a salesperson. So data point number one out of that that changed my life was that 85% of us go to the negative reviews first. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're buying something, you skip the fives and you go to the fours, threes, twos, and ones. And I'm assuming you all do that. Um, and then the other data point was that a product on a five-star scale, that's got an average review score between a four, two and a four, five. That's actually optimal for purchase conversion. Yeah. Meaning a product that's got negative reviews right under it helps the product sell more, which is nuts. So right. I, I sat there and I'm like, all right, that's when a website technique as a salesperson, I'm looking out my, my office window at my reps that are all preaching the gospel of power reviews as being it's perfect. So amazing. Stars. It's perfect. We are perfect. It's amazing. Right. It's never. And, uh, what about this thing? Oh, that's also good. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? We're a five and our competitors, they're all a zero, right? Like, and so I, I'm looking at that thinking, all right, if, if the human mind wants the negative first, and actually is able to get to a purchase decision faster when they've got the negative. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that apply to human to human and B2B selling? And so I start right, digging right. into the behavioral science of it and found really quickly that the answer was emphatically yes. That like, that's how all of you that are listening to this, that's how you're, you're triggering decisions. We don't buy when we're convinced. If we do, we're probably pissed about it. We buy when we can predict. Like you're all, when you're buying something, you're trying to predict and you know, subconsciously that perfection doesn't exist. And that's right, why right. you need the negative. Like, what am I not going to like about it? And so we started trying it at power reviews. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, you know, sales cycles were speeding up. Win rates were going up partially because we were qualifying in better, but partially because we were qualifying out the deals we were going to lose anyway, just faster. And yeah. we started making it really hard on our competitors to message against us. And I, we had a couple of instances where I was like, wait a second, like, this is, this is awesome. Like we got to do something about that. And I've always been passionate about the profession. I just wanted to get the ideas out there. So I wrote the transparency sale, not only to just talk about the nerdery, but how do you apply it to your messaging, positioning, right, prospecting, right. presenting. And then the most popular thing I teach today is negotiating transparently too. But that's that the rest is history, my brother. Yeah. I mean, I think that what's funny there is like, there, I think there's been like little pieces around the edges where people have kind of like felt that like there was opportunities for transparency um, that would like positively impact, um, you know, selling. Great example of that, of course, is like, you know, age old uh, selling behavior, like strip lining, right? It's like, you know what, actually, Todd, I, I, I just, this, this might not be a fit for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now that could partially be like uh, kind of like a, you know, a tactic, right? Like it could be a very good fit right. for them. Yeah. And like, but, but I think what you're potentially doing there is, is exploiting a little bit of that where you're just like, Hey, you know what, actually like, maybe this isn't so, so great for you. It's not for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, now you're also kind of exploiting some other psychological biases there as well, but it probably sounds like it's like a little bit related to what you're, you're talking about as, as well. Um, well, Got before it. we so, move off to that topic, because yeah. I want to, you know, I'm a history nerd too, right? Yeah, like I, for sure. Like when cool people are doing cool stuff on the weekends, I'm reading old books from the early 1900s and magazines. <laughs> what, what's interesting about that is if you read books from like 1910 to 1920, there's entire yeah, yeah. chapters dedicated to honesty and selling. Like back mm -hmm. then they were like, hey, uh, there, there's a, my, one of my favorite authors from back then is a guy named Arthur Dunn. And he's got my favorite sales quote of all time. All right. So buckle up. Here it comes. If the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. Right. So right. like that's where all of this comes from. Now, fast forward to I quit my job as a CRO of Power Reviews. All of a sudden, the kind of the, the, the network finds out. And there's an executive that was at, SA, or at uh, Salesforce at the time that calls me. And he's like, Todd, um, my brother's company needs a CRO right now. They're fast growing. They're going to exit. Like, dude, go do that. It's and a five like, star. It's five stars. It, well, exactly. It was, it was five stars. You're like the, the, the hair on the back of your neck stuck up. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> but he's like, you got to go do this. And I was like, Andy, this book writing, this isn't a memoir, right? Like this has to be done now. And the, the reason is, you know, what you talked about, Pete, was like some of the, the kind of the techniques that used to work to disarm. But the way that I view it is that the world has changed in terms of 
the availability of information, right? Like back then you could lie and still get away with it. Today you can't, right? Like there's so much information at the fingertips of the buyers that has made it actually harder for buyers to buy versus easier. And we can nerd out on that a little bit too. But when you come and you're doing the homework for the buyer and you're like, hey, this is what you might not like. This is what you're going to love. If that stuff you're not going to like is going to be a big, like a big portion of this thing, let's talk about that now. And that could be a piece of functionality that companies like yours usually love that we don't have, yeah. something a competitor does better. Our pricing is at the high end. Like if you're talking about a six figure purchase to a four figure buyer, kind of want to know that at the beginning versus the end, right? The, yeah, the term yeah. sticker shock has never been associated with anything positive in the history of the world, right? right? Like that's <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. It's like, help the buyer predict because they're going to try to do that on their own. And the information is there. And that that's why I felt like this book had to come out when it did. Yeah. I think um, that's the really fascinating question or like, like why, why did it change back? So if back in the day, presumably, and I have some hypotheses about this, but like back in the day, presumably you also had, um, you know, information asymmetry and so what that ought to have done is led you know people to exploit that information asymmetry like the sellers but i think what was um but what you just noted was like uh arthur whose last name is arthur dunn. right now yep. arthur, arthur dunn yep. was was talking about not exploiting information asymmetry and i wonder actually if you if you think about like way back in the day there was um, probably most most sell, like because it because you didn't have the internet because you didn't have a phone because you you couldn't do like cross country or cross state um, selling you had to have somebody who um, like if they were in the local territory they would probably have a reputation um, and there was more information transparency in that regard and it would be very problematic if you would torture reputation and then you know maybe maybe with the advent of the phone now all of a sudden you know you can. You, you can exploit information uh, asymmetry because like, you know what, if you sell, you know, if you, if you sell ice to this Eskimo or whatever over the, over the phone, like they're not, it's not going to kind of route back to you in a, in a problematic way. Whereas now, of course, the, the internet makes it very easy for that to route back to you in a, in a problem. I want like, I, that's just like me spitballing. I wonder what was the thing that like changed that made it such that yeah. it invited kind of the exploitation of information asymmetry, which of course was then destroyed by the internet. Well, I think, I mean, first of all, if you think back to, let's go back to 1916 for a second. That is actually this month, 106 years ago. The first World Sales Congress took place in Detroit, Michigan, right? It's the first sales conference of its time. 3,000 attendees at this thing, you know, sales, dignitaries, the keynote speaker, like imagine like a a conference today, like an MSP conference, 3,000 attendees. And the keynote speaker is the president of the United States. Well, that was the case. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson keynoted that. And it it was at a time where salespeople were seen as the connection between our country being able to take advantage of the progressive era of the Industrial Revolution, meaning that as we were growing, the U.S. could become a power if salespeople did right by their customers, right? Right product, right price, right time. Yeah, Yeah, like like what's the good... what? what's the benefit of what's the benefit of all this all, all this innovation and all this industrial production if there's no route to market like what's right. the point point? and the rest yeah. of the world was getting into world war 1 the us was late getting to it mm-hmm. so we looked at that and said hey salespeople do right by your customers and we'll all benefit forever right like your kids will benefit if you do this right right now and and that involves doing right by customers and so back then sales was trusted it was admired it was respected. Yep. It was not only taught at every college and university that you can imagine in the early 1900s. You know, uh, Harvard, Ohio State, Wharton, they were all teaching sales. High schools were teaching sales. So like there was 11 Boston public schools that were teaching sales in high school back then. And by the, the 1960s, it was all gone, right? And like the reputation. But then it started to come back. And now we're seeing it in universities. Again, I think there's a little over 300 universities that have programs and a, a little yeah. over 100 that actually have it as you know formal curriculum today so it's coming yeah. back but yeah i mean back then uh sales was a respected profession where people looked up to sales people 
and they relied on salespeople to help us all thrive and raise all boats. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things that I talk about in, in founding sales. So, you know, my, my book is less about, um, you know, teaching people a new way to sell, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of like the, the transparency sales, like, hey, here's, a, here's, here's maybe a new old way, or back to the future yeah. way of, of, uh, of selling. But instead, mine is more about, you know, helping people who have not sold before, whether it's founders or, you know, first time salespeople yeah. or what have you to, to be mindful and to be aware of like the things that, you know, is involved in sales in contrast to like what they've learned through like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right. or you right. Or like, well, you know, whatever, whatever movie they've watched. And one of the things that I like to, the way I like to describe, you know, an ideal modern salesperson is is a consultant who happens to have a predilection for a certain solution right um so predilection it's not like you know rabid uh, you know religion right mm -hmm. it's it's like hey you know uh, like i generally think that atrium is great for these characteristics right here however and of course there's the old kind of joke about like you know selling ice to an eskimo or whatever only assholes sell ice to Eskimos, right? right? Like, exactly. oh, yeah. like you're, you're, you're like a terrible human being exactly. if you're, if you're exactly. doing like, they don't, they don't need it unless they're in Florida, right? On right. vacation. Right. And, and it's so like, that's, and, and so I think that that's an, like, and so instead what we should think of ourselves as being is like emissaries for, um, for, you know, for technology, for like, especially in our industry, new technology that probably didn't exist before and is a new way of solving a problem that this person probably has right um and like we are the kind of like the the edge of the economic like microeconomic transactions where you're like you have all these people cruising around trying to find people who have problems and then positioning this thing to solve them if you don't have the problem god bless right yeah. like exactly I'll, I'll, I'll see you at the yeah. bar right right but yeah. but I want to I, I want to reveal to you that you 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 likely have this problem and then you know if we agree on that I'm going to fit this solution to it in a way that is beneficial to you right exactly exactly it's uh, oh there's there's so much that you just inspired but like all of a sudden my brain's like where do I start um, <laughs> but like one of the things I, I guess I'll share with everybody here is I want you to listen to this quote buyers know more nowadays right like th that's a that's a quote you hear all the time buyers. That quote was actually from a 1912 book written by Thomas Herbert Russell called Salesmanship, 1912, 110 years ago, they were talking about the proliferation of information threatening the sales profession. Mm -hmm. Now, the sales profession obviously thrived. Fast forward to 2015, Forrester comes out with their annual state of sales report, and they report that by 2020, so five years from the publication of that, day, of that article, that a million B2B sales jobs would disappear and hundreds of thousands of college age students graduating would not enter the sales profession because there's no more nowadays because of the proliferation of e-commerce and the need for salespeople going bye-bye, right? Uh, I, and I got the screenshot. I still have the article if you want to see it, but fast forward to 2020, not only did a million B2B sales jobs not go away, the opposite happened. My perspective on all of this has to go back to what you were just talking about, Pete, which is this idea that more information doesn't make it easier for buyers. It actually makes it harder. Sure. And the evolution, the evolution of sales has had to be to help the buyers do the homework, right? Yep. And, and that's why I believe transparency is so important. That's why I believe that the future of sales is salespeople becoming trusted advisors through being... Yep type of personality versus being a necessary evil by going, Hey, listen, I did the homework. Here's some stuff you're going to find when you Google search, you know, HRM yeah. review, or whatever. Um, and when you go to G2 and when you go to Glassdoor, here's some things that knowing your scenario might not be a perfect fit. Yeah. Um, but like, let's start there. And if those are not going to be issues, then cool. I, I think you're going to love this stuff, right? Like what do we give up to be great at our core? Do the homework for the buyer so that when they go do the homework and find that it matches, they don't need to do it anymore. But to your point, if yeah, you're going to yeah. lose, you better be losing fast. Like your most valuable asset that all of you have is your time. That's and right, right. this whole old school sales leadership philosophy of, hey, sales reps, at all time, you got to have 4X your pipe, your quota and pipeline. You know what right, that right. inspires them to do? Fill it with 4X. Crap. Right? Yeah, Versus... Please, please. 
can we get better at qualifying out and get it to two X and just be smarter about, Hey, if we're going to lose, lose fast, and we've got to create environments like that. That's what helps the sales profession continue to thrive too. Yeah, for sure. That is so fascinating. Like, yeah, the, the prediction that, that salespeople were going to, that were going to disappear. I was talking, um, there was this, uh, uh, this this gentleman who is a founder of a software company called Cresta, and they make um, some really cool, um, essentially like real time coaching software for call centers. Okay. Um, it's kind of like in the same genre as like Gong and Chorus and so on and so forth. And I, I remember when I was talking to him like six years ago. Initially, he was like, "I'm going to automate salespeople," and I was like. Ooh, I don't know if you're going to do that right. um, because it turns out that salespeople like, like they are persuaders and they are empaths and they're, they're communicators. And what they do is they are like, you know, the, the connective tissue between like the buy side and the sell side. And anytime you have like a solution that has like a complicated decision tree, which mm-hmm. anything that's not like, you know, Comcast cable <laughs> or like <laughs> fill in the blank Super is like, has, yeah. yeah, exactly. It has like a complicated decision tree associated with like anything that's going to be actually to your point earlier about like a considered good, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. I can, and, and if you think about it, like a considered good, and actually in the case of power reviews, that's probably, probably was something like I imagine your guys' ICP was like, you know, if it's a hundred to like a thousand dollars or something, then people are going to like, they start kind of like going like this and, and they want to like be more thoughtful about it. Now talk about something that's in the one to $10,000 range, the 10 to $50,000 range, right? Like there's a big decision tree there. And yeah. so like, like G2 crowd is great. Right. And like, you know, the precursors to G2 crowd, Gartner and Topo and Forrester and so on, so, so on and so forth. Like those are fantastic for taking you a little bit down the decision tree. Right. Yep. Not all the way, but like you eventually you want to talk to a, talk to us, um, uh, an advisor, but not a rep. Right. Yeah. And what I mean by that is like, ideally it is a rep, right. But it's not someone who's like, you know, trying to, trying to slang something at you, but versus like, Hey, let's like have a conversation about this. Like, Oh, okay, cool. Like, it sounds like you have these problems right here that we might not be able to solve, but maybe I can point you in this other direction over here. Exactly. It goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, right? That the future of sales is not about convincing. It's about helping buyers predict, right? Do the homework for them, be the Sherpa through their journey. And I don't see how you replace that anytime in the the near future. You you did trigger one other thing that I just wanted to bring up. And I know we kind of like, here's the topics we're going to talk about and we're going this other direction. Don't worry. I got them. I I got them. I got them right here. We I'll don't even us have us to. Like, target. This is so much fun, I'll, dude. Um, I'll stay on target. But, this is like Star Wars. Yeah, like the uh, the one thing that I wanted to get your opinion on too is I, you know, if you go back a hundred years ago, salespeople were all remote, right? Like, and and to your point about having to sell across the country, they would leave for weeks at a time. And uh, there, there's an article that I just wrote about this idea of salespeople and loneliness was like the big epidemic back in the early 1920s. And you, you like to make a phone call was expensive. Like you might spend right. all your entire salary to call your family from the road, right? 2020 comes around, the pendulum has gone from always remote. You know, we had the telephone, we had email, all this too. Now it's all remote. And I saw even six months ago, people saying, hey, the future of sales is remote. Buyers don't want to see you anymore. They don't want to meet you, Right. Let this last uh, last couple of days, I've been in Connecticut doing a sales kickoff for a company at the uh, the Mohegan Sun. By the way, the uh, if you've ever been to that facility, it's <laughs> sounds it's like a party. It, it, that, well, it's a it's an like Indian the, casino. It's like where uh, Dirty Dancing was filmed, probably. I, I, don't, like... dude, I don't. This place, the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, is like a Vegas style casino. It's that uh, big. like the sports book. The TV is bigger than my house. Like it, it was crazy. <laughs> but amazing. The the uh, I was talking to a rep, and the rep was mentioning to me, he was like, Hey, listen, yeah, I'm starting to get face to face again. And we just want a deal. And the customer said, you were the only vendor that came to see us. Yeah, get on and I was that. like, and I was thinking back to that 1990, there's a, if you go to uh, Google or go to YouTube and just uh, Google or, you know, search United 1990 uh, commercial, there's a commercial where the, the, it was a sales leader comes into a room of salespeople. And he's like, Hey, our biggest customer just fired us. And that biggest customer fired us because they felt like they didn't know us anymore. Here's plane tickets for all of you. We're going to go see all of our customers again. It was one of the most famous United commercials of all Mm -hmm. time. But 
I wonder when we get to that point where our customers start firing us because they don't know us anymore and where that pendulum's going to end up. Are we going to stay? Uh, we're not going back, I don't think, to completely in person, but we're not going completely remote either. I think the pendulum ends up in the middle. And I'm, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's very hybrid, right? Like, um, you know, we're at the point where, you know, we have a few hundred customers at this point. And so, you know, you go to any major city and like, we're going to have, like if it's San Francisco or New York, we're going to have like dozens and dozens and dozens of customers. If you go to, a, a, you know, if you go to, like I was in Atlanta the other day, our new VP of sales is based there. And we have like an oddly large number of customers. And so, you know, we put on, a, like fill your calendar, you put on an event, like we had a, I think we had like 30 sales leaders out to dinner on Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday night, we're like, you know, I hosted an event with a bunch of like founders and CEOs. And on Thursday night, we just did like a big happy hour for like the entire Atlanta sales community. And yeah. people love it. Now, it doesn't, you don't have to be, I don't think you have to necessarily be in market all the time. Right. right. Um, and that's where, you know, cool technologies like Zoom are very helpful the same way that like neat technologies like the telephone were very helpful <laughs> pre previously. But um, but I think one of the things, and I think the transparency sale is kind of related to this because the transparency sale and presumably the transparent um, sales leader is, um, you know, it is keying off of um, key psychological realities that are like, like evolutionary psycho psychologically yeah embedded and i think this is one of the jokes i like to say is like it's pretty hard to mess with 500,000 years of uh, of evolution where like you know standing side by side with somebody being able to like look at them and see like the wrinkles in their eyes are they really smiling are they like blowing smoke up my ass right now are they like legit happy to see me are they like are they are they faking it um i think it's like very hard to to um to replace that and um and so what that means is that you have to layer that into your sales motion um and also your sales management motion as well right. yeah right oh yeah like it's hard to replace back slaps well yeah i mean back when um just before the great resignation started like i'm i'm like back patting myself a little bit here because like i saw <laughs> the great resignation coming um because <laughs> you've got an economy that's flourishing but you've got the combination that's never happened of low physical cost of changing jobs because yes. like the physical cost is, oh, you get me a new laptop and maybe send me some logoed socks, right? Like I don't even have to change my commute. Right, like I'm just gonna keep my, 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 my monitors here and my laptop stand is here and I swap in a new one in my home office. Exactly, right? so physical cost disappears. The emotional cost though, to your point, you can't replace the connection that you have with your fellow employees through Zoom. You just can't, like the brain does not work that way. And as a result, you've got low emotional costs, which meant that the triggers by which people would decide to just unplug here and plug in there were sure. as simple as you just raised my quota, you just shrunk my territory. I just lost a deal. I don't like my pipeline. I just was yeah. uh, talking to my buddies who are making a ton like, of money at another company and they love it and they're hiring. Like the great resignation just became this easy unplug yeah. plug in. So like like the active, the active, the activation energy went way down. And then moreover, probably like the existing affinity connections were 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 way um were way lighter. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. You yeah. can see it coming. Now all right, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think whether I want to go down this rabbit hole, but I will tell you <laughs> one thing. Um in, so let's go back 100 years ago again, 101 years ago. You know, in 1921, salesperson turnover was 77%. In 1922, salesperson turnover was 85%. And that was involuntary. And it followed a six-year period that looked exactly, exactly like the six years leading up to today. Huh. Like to a point where I felt like we are stepping on the same rake again. It is. It was crazy, and that was my latest prediction. Back in January, I predicted a uh, salesperson purge coming, um, and we've seen a little bit of that, right? Like, I hope it doesn't get any worse. Uh, but if you look at a hundred years ago, you, you've got a period where we had slow and steady growth. Uh, 1914 to 1917 looked exactly sure. like 2017 to 2020. Then we had a cataclysmic event that shut off the economy. 2020, it was COVID that shut off the economy for a few weeks. In 1918, we got into World War I for a short period of time, but it shut off the economy. We came out of it with crazy extensive growth. 
right? Like growth through the wind. And, and they were calling, they weren't calling it the great resignation back then, but salesperson voluntary turnover was the highest it had ever been in 1919 and 1920. Like crazy levels. Uh, it was back then it was 60%. The data that I'm reading says that the two years before this year, we were around 57%. So it's almost so exact, like, right? Just like a, huge, then, like a huge, huge thing in musical chairs. Everyone's like jumping up. Exactly, right. they, they weren't, they weren't swapping out their laptops back then, but whatever, right. whatever the equivalent was. Exactly. And then there was a inflation spike. Hmm. Like the inflation went up to 7% and they were calling that catastrophic 7% inflation and uh, then all of a sudden the bottom dropped out and sales leaders were purging their sales teams and trying to get back to profitability because before it was revenue at all costs, right? Which yeah. sounds familiar. So, so, now, sounds familiar. Yeah. And we just crossed over 9% last month, right? In inflation. And we're starting to see turnovers. I, I don't, I was not ringing the hear ye, hear ye, the end is near <laughs> bell, but I was telling people, listen, the economy is going to tighten. And if you haven't lived through one of these things, there's some things that always happen that we need to be prepared for. And, uh, but like, that's another one of those things that like history just keeps repeating itself. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about like how to combat that. And I think one of the things um, that I, uh, like here at Atrium, we think about sales management excellence, right? Like we think about it through the lens of, of helping salespeople or sales leaders use metrics and data to, to be more effective sales leaders, more effective sales coaches, um, but like specifically more effective managers, right? Like more effective coaches who can like help their players be, be better at what they do by of course using metrics that I like to diagnose and see like where they have improvement areas and, and kind of solve that. But also just like management in general is a great way of make like, a management helps people get, be better and helps them have more affinity for your organization and combats all these different things. And that's like what your most recent book was on. So maybe you can kind of talk about how um, the transparent sales leader was inspired based on, you know, like, like how you got from the transparency sale to the transparent sales leader. Yeah. You're like, uh, yeah. Let's, so it's funny. Cause like I actually theorized the transparent sales leader first. Um, but really? it was, uh, when I wrote the proposal for it, I was bored. Like I did, cause I didn't, I wasn't, I like, I didn't have all the behavioral science figured out. I like, it was, it was not ready years ago, but here's the story of it. I was always like, I joked about at the beginning, B, B plus sales rep, but I always knew leadership was my jam, right? Like that was yep. and coaching and teaching and all of that. Now um, I come out of running that crappy sales uh, training company that I bought as a franchise. And it just, it wasn't, it was like cold calling, circa 1985, right? Just like the worst. Crap. Um, so I get, uh, so 2006 comes around, buddy of mine, VP of sales that I'd worked for at SAP was like, Todd, you know, all this stuff better than anybody. I need somebody to come in and run sales ops. Uh, like put the processes in place, teach us how to be enterprise sellers, all of that stuff. So it was like sales ops, sales enablement role, uh, 2006. Two years later, my CEO uh, decides to part ways with that VP of sales, calls me and he's like, Todd, we think you're ready. Guess, get, guess what? <laughs> yeah, like you're running things. I'm like, th like, that was always my goal. I had told him that originally not to take my VP of sales job because I, I loved him, but um, to eventually work into a role like that somewhere else at some point. But he put me in charge. Now here's what happened. Super excited, day one. Day two, I'm like, wait a second, I had a sales process. I had a sales structure. Now I feel like I'm a dog chasing a car down the street every day. Like every day there's a different challenge and I got to go catch it. And it's, you know, a personnel issue, a deal issue, a recruiting Something. issue, a forecast, a board meeting, like whack, all whack, that. Whack, whack a mole. It, it, but that was exactly it. And so I'm too much of a nerd for that. I always have been. So I was like, I need to create a framework for sales leadership for myself. And I couldn't find one anywhere. Like I, I looked and I was like, all right, I'm going to create one. And then over time, so I created one. It became the means that I used for all my planning and strategizing, all my communicating up, down, side to side. Uh, when the bullets started flying, I always had that to fall back on. It became what I called the five F's of building revenue capacity. And then over the last uh, 14 years, I built in all the behavioral science and then laid it on a bed of transparency. And as the, the market started to tighten, you could see it happening. 
like we need to optimize for this. So I can share with you what the five F's are uh, for everybody Please. else, because I, I think um, if you just internalize the five F's and don't even get the book, and th those you're are still those going. Are, to... Those are in here, right? Yes, exactly. But like, if you internalize the five F's, I'm ten. Then go to sleep. I'm telling you, you will be 98% of ahead ahead of the rest of the sales leadership world. Like I literally used it for interviewing. I, I had I, my ass kicked by a uh, Sequoia board member. I used that. And at the end, he called me world-class when I wasn't, but because I had a structure, I sounded world-class. Little, so, little, 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 little jet of mind trick. Love it. Well, okay. Yeah, exactly. So here, here's the five Fs for everybody. If you're ready, like get your notebook ready. I, I'll, I'll explain to you what the role of sales leadership is. You can take every responsibility that you have and it falls into one of five buckets, all right? Your first bucket as a sales leader or revenue leader in general is when you think about your team and their most valuable asset, which is their time, it's to establish, maintain, and grow focus. So the first half is focus, meaning are they working on the right accounts, the right verticals, right geos, right sizes, the work, right individuals, so the right demographics, levels, roles, titles, the ICP. right prerequisites, right? Like yep. whatever it is. And actually I, I go further. I, I've got a whole theory about ICP is great. You need to go deeper. And I call it oh, extreme sure. firmographic focus. We could talk about that later. But so focus okay. is your first initial and ongoing responsibility. The second F then is you build the field organization. So the team taking the field, the field is the second F to support the focus, not the other way around. And the field is the team and the tools. Right. So yeah. it's putting the right people with the right experiences in the right locations, with the right cop, with the right tools, the right resources to support your focus. All right. Yeah. So yeah. you got focus, you build a field to support that focus. Your third yeah. F yeah. is now the fundamentals. Your, that team, that field, you got to make sure they get the right things right consistently. Right. You're prospecting, presenting, uh, discovery, negotiating, all that stuff. Got to yeah. make that. That's your responsibility as a sales leader. Fundamentals. Yep. Yeah. Your fourth F, probably no surprise, is forecast. You've got a responsibility to predict the future. That includes all the metrics, the KPIs, the things that you've got to be able to use to be proactive instead of reactive. And then the fifth F, which is arguably the most important and the cheesiest, is fun. So fun. You've got, you've got a responsibility to create an environment where your team wants to show up every day, wants to stay, wants to do their best, and wants to become an advocate for you and your organization. I call that and, and that became a whole half of the book. So the first half is the five Fs and tools and tactics and behavioral science that optimize each one. The second half of the book is fun. And it's the, the science <laughs> of intrinsic inspiration. So like the, there's, there's literally science that outlines the six categories of what drive us to show up every day. And if you think your team is, is money motivated, you're right if you're doing it wrong. <laughs> that variable compensation become should become the reward for work they love to do instead of the reason right, exactly and right. and that's that's the whole uh piece of this thing that became like the, the cause of the, book. the causality goes like the other direction there it's just like hey like i work my ass off and i take my lumps from my uh you know from from prospects or whatever the reason why i do that is because I want to be a better seller. I want to, you know, have mastery. I want to get, you know, I want to innovate, et cetera, et cetera. And the good news is the harder I do that, the more, you know, the, the bigger my variable is, is going to, is going to be. Yeah, yeah exactly. hundred percent. Like, yeah, I, um, one of our board members, actually, you probably know Brett, um, from your time at, um, Salesforce and exact target, Brett Queener. Um, he's, uh, one of our, um, he's one of our board members and he actually recommended to me, I'm reading a, a book on, um on just management right now called multipliers um oh, yeah. Yep. yeah and um and then the other one of course like is um drive which it, is daniel yeah. pink i want to say yes that's is, that's is, yep. is drive yeah. yeah and so like obviously what you're describing right there is like highly aligned with um with drive right and like the things that make people want to get up in the morning and 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 work um and and have success and so um Got it. And so like, I think the, the, the five F's things that you're talking about there, I, I think a lot of people can identify with the notion of like, there's always a fire, there's always a mold will be whacked, et cetera. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we really encourage folks to focus on um, and structure for themselves is like, 
um, effective operating rhythms. Um, and so, you know, like fr a framework such that like a time and a place for all the things. Yeah. Right. So instead of it just being kind of like spinning in circles, it's like, hey, here we are. Is this sun? It's it's uh, Monday at 11 a.m. And like and now is the time where we have our sales team meeting. Then it has these sub components associated with it. Mm -hmm. And then we have our enablement hour, but that's a at a different time. Right. And then we have our pipeline reviews, but that's a, and that's at this time. But that's different than our one on ones. And also the agendas are different. Right. We have, you know, and so just being very intentional about the design of the flow of a day, the flow of the week, the flow of the month, the flow of the quarter that allows people. So instead of the temptation being like, oh man, I got to like go jump on this deal. It's like, hey, don't worry. We will talk about that in pipeline review or our deal strategy session or whatever. Like, oh, there's a personnel issue. Well, there's a personnel issue because you haven't been doing your one-on-ones and talking about career development. Right. Or this person's forecast is all screwed up right now because you actually weren't using metrics in your one-on-ones you know a month ago or 60 days ago if you had been you would have noticed that he stopped prospecting and now only now 60 days later is that showing up to to bite him in the ass but like it's like a time and a place for all these things that matter and then if you do that i'm a big um a big sports guy like it's a it's like systems systems coaches like process coaches like you know Popovich or like Steve Kerr or whatever, which is like you, like the system and the process is bigger than any of the individual super, like superheroes. And then if people trust the process and like you give them nice, you know, nice swim lanes, it's not like they're in a vice. It's like, no, no, here's the guide, you know, here's the guides here. You can innovate within them. People are way more successful. And that includes managers too, because we think about it as relates to reps. If you have managers, you have to give them, and I'm, I'm at this point right now where I have two managers. I'm a VP of sales who reports into me, and then we have a new really talented um, sales manager, but just making sure that like the systems are consistent between, between those teams. Like this is how we do one-on-ones, this is how we do pipe reviews, this is how we do X, Y, Z makes it such that people actually like can thrive within that environment versus just kind of being like spinning about in circles. Exactly. I mean, that was the, the magic of the five Fs. like in a couple of ways you use that. Like, first of all, for anybody who's on here, that's in uh, revenue leadership of any sort, you could literally, as soon as you hang up from this, write down the five Fs and create a 30, 60, 90 day plan for yourself in 20 minutes. Like that was part of the magic of this is like the number of times I used to be asked for like, hey, do you have a template for a, a a 90 day plan. Like, all right. You know, yes. It's like, you could literally sit down and think about your team and go, Hey, how do I feel about our focus? Like, are we calling on the right companies and the right individuals? Do I feel comfortable that my team, when they wake up in the morning knows where to spend their time? And by the way, the field, like, do I have the right team as it relates to that focus and the types of deals that we're going and the types of conversations we need to have and oh, types of conversations, fundamentals, how do I feel about our messaging and positioning? Like if I asked all my reps what we do, would I feel like I work at the same company? How do I feel about our ability to qualify? And, you know, are we discounting the crap out of deals? And, oh, discounting, that affects our forecast. How do I feel about my ability to predict in the KPIs that I'm measuring? Is the word key and key performance indicator all of them so that none of them are key? Or like, am I really tight on those? And then fun. How's turnover? How do I feel about my team's intrinsic inspiration to where when they wake up in the morning, they can't wait to get it happening versus they show up because they need a paycheck and they're worried about the economy, right? Like you could literally do that and then go, all right, what am I going to do to fix it? And here's the execution plan. And there's your 30, 60, 90 day plan. I literally had to do that following a quarter miss where I, my CEO calls me and says, Todd, we missed the quarter. Um, the chairman wants you to fly out to Sand Hill Road and they're bringing in a forensic sales expert to kick your ass for three and a half hours. Like, oh, Lovely. this should be fun, right? It was, it was like, I was a new leader too. Like I, what? And so I got there, I'd done some planning, but I literally was able to run the meeting. And, and that goes back to that world-class statement where this guy was ready to kick my ass. And I was like, hey, listen, here's the way that I think about revenue leadership. Here's the buckets I'm prepared to go for, through each one of these five and tell you about the way that I think about it. You can pound me on any of it. And so I ran the meeting and at the end, he's like, I've never seen anybody do that before. Like, that was awesome. And that, I don't think that made me a better leader. It just made me sound better, right? Like I need all the help I can, I can get. But for all of you, imagine your next 
interview, you're going to go interview for a leadership role. And somebody asks you, how would you think about this? Like, oh, you know, I, I think about it in these five buckets, right? This is my responsibility. Here's the way that I think about each of these elements. You will sound a hundred times smarter than anybody else. It's just like, you know, I just get it done. I got lots of experience. Like, right. and you're the one that's got structure and they're the one that's grunting. You're going to kill right. it. So that that's part of the magic of this whole thing. Yeah. That's like the thing that, um, you know, you don't really understand something very deeply in, until you can explain it in terms like right. a five-year-old would understand, um, yeah. which is kind of that. Um, I think one thing I wanted to um, touch that that's cool about the the transparent sales leader, and and I hope folks um, will will go ahead and grab a, grab a copy because it sounds like super um, sounds super delightful. The um, you had talked about like things that we had got like did well in the past that um, that we get wrong today, and I think you had something around like forecasting that you wanted to touch on. <laughs> yeah. There. Yeah, this was this is a fun one for everybody. And I would like, I mean, Pete, I'd love to get your take on this because you you think about things in a modern sense so well. And I love that about you. Um, when you know, again, when I'm reading this old stuff from the early 1900s, the same issues, the same problems, the same challenges, like uh, Salesmanship magazine from the late 1900s, like 1906 90, to 1909, they got a Q and A section, right? And it's the same problems you all have today, except one. One thing that they do not talk about as a problem back then that we as sales leaders and revenue leaders always talk about today is, gosh, forecasting so hard. And I, I think I put my finger on it. And, and here's the story. You, Brent, you mentioned Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, like 1992 Sorry. movie for anybody that hasn't seen no. it. Um, like just, you could, again, YouTube, the, uh, the scene where uh, no, no. Alec Baldwin who's Blake mm -hmm. from Mitch Murray comes and parades the team and, you know, don't have kids nearby. Like last time I watched it, I think Definitely I cried not. Sleep after it. Right. But yeah, there's one thing that he got right. And it was AIDA. AIDA yes. was something that was theorized in 1898 by yep. Elias St. Elmo Lewis, who theorized that every buyer goes through four stages on their journey to buy. Right. A meaning attention. Like, are they paying attention? Right. I meaning interest. Are they interested in what I am providing? D, which is desire. Now, Baldwin got that wrong and called it decision, but it was desire. Okay. Right. Have they inspired a desire to want this? And then action is the last day, which is, are they ready to take action? Now, that became the sales process and the forecasting methodology of every single sales organization in every single book. Like, to the point where in 1924, uh, Elmer Ellsworth Ferris wrote, I'm not even going to talk about AIDA because everybody worth their salt knows it's AIDA. Now, right, right. what that means is back then, salespeople and their process was based on buyer behavior and recognizing buyer behavior. There's right, no right. sales process, not one in any of those books that follows what seller activity should be. You don't see uh, discovery, qualification, demo, uh, demo proposal, close. Not one, zero. And they got forecasting right. Who knew that trying to predict when a buyer would buy based on recognizing what a buyer was doing would be more accurate more than accurate. 1993, Siebel, 1999, Salesforce, HubSpot, all of those out of the box, every stage in the forecast is seller Things activity that, based. Yeah, you, that you do. The rest exactly. Does. And it, it became this thing where we can say all day long that we're buyer focused, but are we? Yeah. When all the endorphins that a sales rep gets in moving a deal through a cycle is based on sales stages or sales process that's all seller focused, right? I'm thinking about what I'm doing. I'm not caring about where the buyers, I'm, I'm like, maybe I pretend to, but I think that's the miss. I think, and so at Power Reviews, uh, my, the forecast chapter in the new book is, is kind of long because I take people through how you don't have to blow up your stages, but you can overlay on your stages yeah, like buyer behavior recognition. Behavior, behavior right. like the exit criteria has to be tied to buyer behavior. And this right. is why, like, I mean, I think there are, so th this is where kind of like modern sales software can be very, um, can be helpful in this regard because it almost surmounts some of the like rep, rep bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I, and what I mean by that is like, um, 
like uh, one of the things that so atrium has some like forecasting functionality it's not the primary use case is because like it, the forecast is actually just one metric of many metrics that you should be paying attention to but if you think about one of the mechanisms that we um we have a specific kpi that people really like called um win rate weighted pipeline um and so what it does is it doesn't like it doesn't use like the percentages that you like have for your various stages or whatever that are declared in in CRM or whatever, and it doesn't use commit uh, or sorry, it doesn't use forecast categories because like reps like make that stuff up, uh, and the reason and not because like they're bad people or whatever because usually they have like a sales manager being like ah, 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 right? right and we'll talk about this as it relates to commit um, and kind of like forecasting here in a second, but instead it it like it it does a math based behavior, a math-based forecast officer, like, hey, for every single op that is in this rep's pipe, right, what stage is it in? And what has been the historical win rate for this rep out of that stage over the trailing, you know, whatever statistically significant sample sampling period is? And then moreover, let's not actually, let's not believe their, their close date. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. and instead, like, let's not believe their close date because, you know, um, happy ears and, and what have you. Instead, let's use what is the, the average um, time to close from state from that stage entry. Right. And, mm -hmm. and then, of course, like, I mean, that's that's just like math based stuff that, that we do. And then, of course, there's like, you know, there's like Gong and, and Clary and all those guys doing stuff kind of predicated on like, cool, it's great that you're like emailing them as much as you want. Um, are they emailing you back? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. are they responding to your like those those signifiers? And I think there's actually this is why I'm a big fan of um, mutual plan software because again it helps with transparency right. um like we use a cord here at um at atrium but if like buyers are doing behaviors in the mutual plan software we're like they're checking off like okay cool yeah i checked off my task and and what have you and you you can you, you get this with like kind of various signals coming out of things like high spot and seismic and so on and so forth it kind of helps helps with all that stuff but i think the crux of all of it is is like index off of buyer behavior don't index off of rep behavior exactly yeah and it doesn't have to be hard right and, it does, yeah. and we we had gotten to a point where our forecast uh we created a 90-day forecast we were within three and a half percent of that 90-day forecast six quarters in a row and one quarter we were within twelve thousand dollars of a seven-figure forecast like part of that was like that had to be luck but and that's true uh but you know just being able to create an environment where reps felt comfortable losing, where the reps felt comfortable sharing where buyers are and buyer behavior and getting aligned around that just changed the whole dynamic and environment around the way that we forecasted. Yeah, and I think you, um, one of the things we wanted to touch on was this notion of like how commits yeah. and, and kind of like forecast categories kind of like runs counter to like the goal of, exactly. of like an accurate forecast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the concept of the commit and I was taught the commit, right. And it was just like, Hey, I have to forecast as a sales leader, the reps need to uh, have that kind of accountability, but that, that could be the, the one benefit, but there's about 10 downsides to the commit. I believe that the commit is a Petri dish for lying, right. That it creates an environment where not only are reps not honest about it, but you create an environment where when the deal's going south that they committed to, do you want them to come to you as a leader first or last? Because you're causing them to come to you last, right? We, we actually created an environment where we were celebrating the losses, right? And commit, like, you, how do you commit to something you can't fully control? That, control like, that's exactly. just crazy. But you know that the, the underperformers are going to commit more because that puts off them getting fired or putting on a pip. They, they overcome, um, the overcome, like, the like overachievers are going to undercommit because they don't want all the eyeballs on them. Like, well, what are you doing? So yeah. my thought was, um, it was something that we used to do is we used to literally celebrate losses, like, cause the reps are already getting hit in pocket because you know, their quota, their, their commission. We used to like one time we did a champagne toast for a, a rep that lost a big deal that had put a bunch of time into it. Now that sounds crazy, but what are we doing? Well, we're celebrating the effort but we're also yeah. celebrating the lessons that could be learned, right? Yep. We create an environment that with the commit, what, what we ended up finding is like reps were afraid to mark deals lost. So our forecast yeah. got inaccurate. 
they push out close dates because they didn't want to admit that the deal, like, oh, they're just delayed. Um, or sometimes the deals would suddenly magically become unqualified and go back to suspect, right? Right. When we started embracing losses and getting rid of that, that dirty word commit, our, our reps, like they weren't afraid to go, hey, listen, here was an issue. I didn't see it. I wish I would have seen it. Look at your deals and what, what looks like that so that maybe we can tackle that up front. We end up, you know, not only losing faster, but we stopped losing for the same reason over and over again, because reps weren't afraid to share the real reasons yeah. why and weren't forced to go back to their cube, like Charlie Brown checking the mailbox on Valentine's day. Right? Like instead <laughs> it's like, Hey dude, you know, or do that. Like, great job. What can we learn from this? How do we make sure that there's stuff in the mailbox every time? Right? Like that's the, that's the whole concept of this. And that's why I think commit is a dirty word and it needs to go away. Yeah, we um, the way that we run that in our sales team meeting is we, we talk more about like intentions and stretches than mm -hmm. than kind of commits. Like these yeah. are the ones that I'm targeting because I think this is like a big thing. This is something that scrambles people's brains with respect to sales and why I think you know people who kind of grow up um, you know, enjoying baseball and things like that, uh, probability based things. Um, end up like kind of getting it faster because like, like you don't have a, you enter the batter's box with an intention that you're going to get a hit but you know that even if like you enter with every intention to get a hit every single time if you're do like if you're batting 300 or you're batting 250 like that's pretty good but you don't go into the batting the batter's box intending to, right. to bat 250 right mm -hmm. so and and if and if you so like setting an intention with respect to certain things that are actually viable is feels like a more effective way of going about it versus like hey this is this is a lock right um, exactly todd we're out of time this is super fantastic thank you for taking the time um folks who joined us thank you check out todd's book it's uh absolutely fantastic check out his old book check out his new book we got to do like a bundle todd it's the, it's the transparency todd bundle um <laughs> Next uh, next week, August 5th, we're going to have the VP of Sales Operations and Finance from uh, Vanta, Meg Goach. Uh, she's absolutely fantastic. She used to be at AWS, uh, JW Player, MongoDB, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll have a little operations, kind of like NerdFest next week. Um, Todd, enjoy the uh, in, enjoy the lake. Uh, have a good time, uh, you know, water skiing with the Sasquatch and have a fantastic <laughs> weekend. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was a blast. Okay, I'll see you. All right, Bye. see you.